We will now start the first session, and the headline for this session is the Nordic Welfare State Post-Corona. The COVID-19 pandemic has served as a stress test for the Nordic, Nordic welfare model. And the questions that we are going to, to ask ourselves in this first session are, how has the system or the systems handled with the external threat? And how have the Nordic countries coped with these challenges compared to other countries in, in Europe? And are there signs that the Nordic welfare state now is less universal and less generous than in the past? The first person here to answer these questions is Bent Greve. Bent is a professor in social science with an emphasis on welfare state analysis at the University of Roskilde in Denmark. Bent is also the author of the book Myths, Narratives and the Welfare State, a book that was published this year. Please, Bent, the screen is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I will start sharing my screen and, and thanks for, for the invitation. I mean, in, in these times, um, it, it would have been nice to be in Helsinki. I think this autumn is the third time I'm giving a lecture from Denmark uh, to Finland. Um, and, and sometimes I hope to see uh, some of you in, in on, not online, but that's part of, of the you can say uh, the consequences of, of these recent uh, changes. So my my question was, um, and thanks for for the, uh, also for the introduction. I agree with those uh, ministers, etc., saying that the Nordic welfare state models has, so to speak, been in a constant change and flux, and had been able to to cope with the ongoing pressure on the welfare state. And what I would be doing here is to say first that. What do we in fact find is the, the historical distinct elements of the Nordic welfare states? <clears throat> First of all, we are seen as, as universal welfare states. We are dependent on being having the right to live in a country that we can have access under specific conditions, specific criteria to get a welfare benefit. We are compared to others, not to the same degree dependent on having paid for our own insurance, so, so to speak. We also in general finance the welfare state out of general state financing with different emphasis, different structures in the Nordic countries, but overall the state has a strong role in financing uh, the welfare state. We have a strong focus on, on decommodification. This is in fact referring back to Espen Anderson's uh, heartbreaking work uh, in 1990. And by this is meant that we are able to uphold a relatively good living standard even at times where we're not able to be or can be on, on the labor market. At the same time, we have had, and way back also with active labor market policy originated in Sweden in the 50s by Rehn and Meitner, a very high level of labor market participation. We still have, and also in, in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, we in fact have been some of the countries in Europe best able to cope with the pressure uh, both on, on the private sector and the public sector, uh, given the COVID-19 crisis. We have also been discussing equality, both uh, seen from an economic perspective and a gender perspective. And I will come back to, to the issue about equality, because I think that is one of the challenges we right now have in the Nordic countries, that it looks like we are, we are less equal uh, than, than we used to be. And I think that's important to, to be aware of and how to discuss that uh, in, in the years to come and what we can do about it. We also have, <coughs> I mean, the Nordic welfare state has been known as having a high generosity of welfare benefits, relatively high replacement rate, relatively high uh, level of benefit in all subsections, but that perhaps is challenge uh, of recent years and this is presumably one of the reasons why we see an increase in inequality uh, in the Nordic uh, countries. And we, the Nordic welfare state was also some of the first welfare states to move towards having a higher degree of services provided by the welfare state. I mean, part of the reason that both gender can be on the labor market 
is that we have affordable and high quality daycare uh, for children in all the Nordic countries. We have also different kinds of, of leave systems making it possible for all uh, to be on the labor market. So in this sense, the service we have in the welfare state is not just a cost for the state, it's also an important issue for the private sector that parents can work and can work uh, in, in a good way. And of course, this will, and I will not talk about this today, shall be, be looked upon also with relation to the educational system and how we help in people having the necessary competences to be on the labor market. I mean, we also seen as, as happy nations. And the latest report from the World Happiness showed Finland at top, Denmark second, Iceland fourth, Norway sixth, and Sweden seventh. So I mean, all the five Nordic countries are among the happiest countries in the world. And to the Finns, please be aware, just because you have the highest score, that's not necessarily the same as you are the best. Uh, some average uh, rounding here, but the important point here is that the Nordic welfare states are at top. And we know that the welfare state plays a role, play a role in having happy citizens. That has something to do with, with trust in, the, in the, the management, the political system. It's something about the social cohesion. It's also as indicated by, by the, the, the first uh, welcome to the conference, that we have a high GDP. We have good opportunities in the Nordic countries, jobs, economic security, and we also have good healthcare systems, all being important elements. So if we not only want to be good, to be country, but also be good countries with happy citizens, then the welfare state are extremely important. And they, and this data here, and they have been rather stable uh, since this was started measuring long time ago. And this is uh, also in the, the World Happiness Report. And I can, I can say that Finland, Denmark and Norway has been at the top um, for different times. And there's been some shift, but always, always, I think that's important to be aware of five Nordic countries at the top uh, when you look at happiness. On the other hand, we have an issue here with, with inequality. As you can see from this figure, there has been in Sweden and Denmark an increase in inequality since 2004. Iceland has moved uh, in the other direction, back to the devil. So therefore, by now we have a situation where the inequality is lower in Iceland and Norway, with Finland in between, and with the highest degree of inequality in Denmark and Sweden. And in both in Denmark and Sweden, it's, it's a mixture of change in, in the financial system, combined with that we have less generous benefit than, than we used to have. And therefore we have seen that that's the historical position um, with inequality is not as good as it used to be within Europe. And why this is a problem, I mean, we, we have seen a lot of books and articles from Stiglitz, Piketty, etc., a lot of other peoples over the last uh, five to 10 years, all indicating that the high degree of inequality will imply other problems with regard to, to crime, health, social integration, etc., etc. So inequality, as I see it, is one of the big challenges for the Nordic welfare states uh, in the years to come. And if you look at this one from 2000 to 2019, here you can see it was 3.9 point increase in Sweden, 3.4 in Denmark, one in Finland, a decline in Iceland. Iceland has as one of the countries uh, in the Nordic welfare state being able to reduce the degree of inequality and Norway have kept it stable. So this is an indication of that even if we often say that the Nordic welfare states are completely dissimilar, they are not always similar. And a lot of, of uh, issues as also said in, in, the, in the, the start of the seminar, we can learn of each other and sometimes it's good to see what has been working well in one country, this might also work well uh, in another country. So there are a lot of things we can learn of from each other and we can learn best practice as a way of dealing with and see what has worked might, <coughs> sorry, might presumably also work uh, in another country. And therefore, and now I can't see my own slide here uh, of, uh, here I have it, 
yeah, this one. I mean, Iceland is the, the country in Europe which the second uh, lowest degree of inequality. Norway five, Finland seven, Sweden nine, and Denmark and number eleven among the among uh, the European in, within the EU countries degree of inequality. So Sweden and Denmark is no longer that distinct with regard to economic inequality as they used to be, as an indication indication of that we have seen some perhaps movement away from from the previous well known issues. Uh, of the Nordic welfare states. Um, and if you look at the overall development, I mean, looking at the data, there's in general no sign of macro austerity with regard to welfare state spending. It goes a little bit up, it goes a little bit down, and naturally in 2020 there was an increase in spending in order to cope with uh, the COVID-19, in a sense and effect, uh, going back to a classical Keynesian way of keeping the economy going, even if the private sector had difficulties and uh, avoiding, uh, in fact, a strong increase in unemployment with uh, job retention schemes, etc., and support for the private sector. But even if we skip 2020, also in until 2020, it looks like there's no, no macro austerity enough, but despite what's been argued in, in a lot of discussions, we still see more money available for healthcare, for long-term care, for daycare, etc. Uh, so on the macro level, there's no austerity. This do not imply that there might not be some people who feel that there have been reduction. We also have an increase in a number of people in need of different kinds of benefits uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. We have the whole issue about demographic aging implying a need for being aware of how can we cope with this one. But we have seen, despite no austerity in spending, we have seen there's been a reduction in replacement rates since 2000, as well as a reduction in the level of taxes and duties. So this opened for also in the future a risk that this money is available to cope with expectations among citizens for better services, uh, for better quality in a lot of areas in the years to come, and also with the, with the impact on spending by the demographic uh, transition. And therefore, overall, you can say that there has been um, a higher focus on services, there has been less focus on generosity and benefits, uh, and therefore the Nordic welfare state has even more been moving towards being service welfare states and less income transfer states than they used to be uh, in the historical development uh, of the Nordic welfare state. We've also seen, with two different degrees, and I'm not going to detail it, I mean, I've, that's not what I have time for, but we see a tendency was this by now labeled welfare chauvinism. And by welfare chauvinism is meant that, that the focus is on how can we ensure that the benefits mainly goes to native citizens. This uh, implies, for example, there will be a higher focus on pensions and less on social assistance in some countries, given that those outside or on the, on the margin of labor market more often might be, be migrants uh, than native citizens. And this can imply a less social cohesion, a stronger degree of splitting of society, and therefore can give rise to, to several issues for, for the continued development uh, of, of the welfare state uh, in the years to come. And, and the focus on services, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's obvious given demography, as I already said, but we also know, I mean, all of us, when we get used to have um, the news, IT, the news telephone, mobile phone, the news uh, PC, the news, et cetera, et cetera. We want often something new. And that's part of the, the difficulty in managing the welfare state that people have continuously new expectations and would want completely higher level and quality of service, especially when it comes to healthcare. Uh, we know that citizens would expect that if they become sick, the best service will be available. And why should we expect that? We are rich countries. But if one should fulfill that uh, constant ambition, that might imply a risk of a pressure on other parts of the services uh, in the welfare state. <clears throat> we have a constant discussion of whether to use the markets 
uh, to deliver a lot of these services or whether they should be delivered within the welfare state. And therefore, marketization on the one hand might be more efficient, but on the other hand, it might imply that there would be less good working conditions for, for social workers, uh, doctors, nurses, etc. And it might be a less equal access to welfare by, by marketization. And there we need to have, so to speak, uh, analyze each subsection of the welfare state uh, by, by by area to see whether this will imp uh, improve or will reduce uh, the level of services within these areas. And as COVID-19 has shown us, there it indicates the pressure on, on long-term care and healthcare. We can see it in all countries, we can see there's an issue here and that will, will be there anyhow uh, also in the futures and we do not know when the next uh, crisis arrive. I mean, so far we have, I have also here mainly been, been, been speaking about and mentioned COVID-19, but it's only 10 years ago we had a financial crisis with a huge impact on the public sector uh, spending and the money available for public sector services and income transfers. And therefore one needs constantly to be aware of that new pressures and new suddenly changes can have an impact on the ability to finance the welfare state. And therefore, I, I also believe that we will, will be in constant needs of having on the one hand, a solid public sector economy by, by showing the, the quality and the impacts of public sector spending to the citizen. So we can keep the legitimacy of the welfare state. We can keep the willingness of, of the, the members of society to pay for the welfare state. And at the same time, develop in, in these uh, fields where people would like to expect this to be the case. Here, uh, I, this is from, from a book uh, which will be published um, next year by Edward Elga called Rethinking the Welfare State. And here I've tried um, to, to look at some indicators and I won't have time to go into detail by, by this one. There's an, a number of detail, one where happiness, as I said, is an important issue counts half and one where a number of dimension are giving equal weight. And looking into it, it looks like that, yes, the Nordic countries and Norway, I'm sorry, and Iceland is not included here because I only had the data from EU, the Nordic welfare state are still in a high position. It, it, that will, that not depend on what we have, that will be among the best uh, countries in Europe, but with the difference to the next level, less strong and, than it used to be. And perhaps it looks like we are having a Western and Northern European uh, division more than a broader division within Europe. And even with, with uh, Czechia and Slovenia as part of the development. And then we have an Eastern and Southern European development. So, so also, I, I mean, on one hand, you can use these data to indicate this still going well in the Nordic countries. But we also have perhaps a dimension of, of differences within Europe, which might imply uh, new problems uh, in, in the years to come, one should be, be aware of. And given my, my, the time I was given, here's my conclusion. Um, the Nordic welfare state are comparatively still functioning well. I mean, sometimes I'm, when I'm talking with colleagues in Europe and knowing what discussion we have in the different Nordic countries and the critics of the welfare state in Nordic countries, uh, I'm, it's striking the, that there's such a strong critic sometimes given how well they in fact are functioning. Nevertheless, they're a sign of changes, they're less generous, they're less inclusive than they used to be. And that's something one perhaps needs to be aware of in the years to come. But they have also so shown a high degree of resilience and ability to cope with crisis, the financial as well as the COVID-19 crisis there's still a high degree of gender equality. I know there's discussion about whether all countries have reached the same degree of equality in all areas, and there's still areas where it could be better, um, but nevertheless, compared to other countries, it's, it's, it's reasonable well working in, in the Nordic welfare state. Service has become more important. And again, inequality is, as I see it, a main channel challenge for the continued social cohesion in the Nordic welfare state. So yes, the Nordic countries are still distinct, there are challenges and tendencies towards perhaps looking more like other Western countries, 
but we have options and possibilities to continue to have a, a good welfare state. I hope this will be fruitful days. And again, I would have been nice to be together with you so we could have an informal chat. And if some of you has, has just uh, questions or comments not able to ask here, drop me a mail uh, or something we can talk about, then I'm, I'm perfectly willing to discuss with you and come up with further information. And it would be nice to have your viewpoints of some of these issues, which we could have had informally if we had been together in, in one room. We aren't. So my, my mail is always open and also later to answer questions for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bent. Bent will be, be back in about 40 minutes for, uh, for a dis discussion. And you can also use the chat if you like to, um, to ask Bent a question. We will now continue from a university in Denmark to a university here in Finland. The next speaker is a professor at the University of Helsinki. She will answer the question, Nordic welfare states still standing or changed? by the COVID-19 crisis. Please, Minna van Gerven. Please unmute your microphone, Minna. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm trying to get this slideshow going, just a second. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Jens, for this very wonderful uh, uh, introduction. And thank you so much for the organizers for inviting me. It's a, such a great pleasure to be, be here today. And unfortunately, not on location, but uh, on, on Zoom. And indeed, I'm a professor at the University of Helsinki, but next year onwards, I will be uh, affiliated with University of Tampere. So I took the liberty of already announcing this also on this slide. And today we're going to talk about the Nordic welfare states in, in very much in line that Bent, uh, my, my very established colleague already, portrayed uh, from his very, very long and extensive uh, research and, and wonderful things that we heard already about the welfare states. Uh, it gives me a good uh, opportunity to continue and trying to reflect shortly what can we say now about uh, the, the possibilities of the Nordic model to survive on such a moment such as pandemic. And it has been said a couple of times already during this seminar that pandemic is really seen as a stress test to the Nordic model. And similar to other kind of external crises, of course, uh, pandemics is, is seen as a, a kind of a test, trying to, feel, trying to see whether we are able to cope with extensive uh, differences or, or difficulties. And in many ways, we often, think in terms of, of um, uh, pandemic or these kinds of external crises to be something that is somehow showing us what is actually being uh, murking uh, down downside of the sea. So with this uh, pandemic, just like with the low tide, we actually can see things that have been hidden and things that will get exposed now when we are dealing with this new kind of moment. And even though it's, it's still quite early to say what, what we have learned from the pandemic, uh, we have to say that we have now one year plus accounting and experience with this pandemic. Uh, of course, we actually would have liked to have been able to talk about what happens after pandemic, but unfortunately, the pandemic seems to be have ex extended until further notice. Uh, but what we can say already is, is that pandemic is very much seen as a syndemic shock. And it really has put our welfare state structures uh, under a quite a scrutiny. Uh, we, we are having to deal with similar kind of crises at, at the economy, labor market, policy system, society, all at the same time. And all these are, are caused by an extended and an external shock. And as we have been talking already, even though we are just starting, uh, we have already experienced that pandemic as this kind of syndemic shock has really revealed vulnerabilities in our welfare systems and in public service uh, uh, deliveries. 
And what we can say also with respect to, to the knowledge that we have now about this pandemic as a syndemic shock is that what comes to the fore is really the, uh, the syndemic nature of, of pandemic, really referring to the understanding of co uh taking place in our societies. So this term basically comes from the health science research, but basically it relates uh, to these issues of inequalities of this virus, uh, COVID-19, being very tightly netted uh, uh, to, to other kind of existing uh, social determinants of inequalities, whether it relates to health, well-being and welfare. So it really seems to be that these, these COVID-19 inequalities are nested within the broader aspects of inequalities that we have had already before. And in that sense, of course, my metaphor of slow tide uh, exposing things that are hidden, of course, come to the fore. And although we seem to be talking about pandemic, uh, understanding of the Greek uh, uh, language uh, of, of its origin, pan meaning in Greek, all of us, uh, the research has really clearly showed that the pandemic is not meaning all of us. Uh, at least in the harshest nature of its consequences. Rather, uh, the effects of uh, the pandemic seem to be uh, very disproportionate uh, regarding to population and regions in the world. So some groups of the society are more, uh, more strongly affected by pandemic and some regions are more strongly affected than others. So we should not forget that pandemic, although it refers to the understanding of all of us, it really also has this uh, more uh, uh, harder effects on some groups of us in our societies. And this is very important to take in, into mind. For me, as a, as a professor of social policy and social policy scholar, when we talk about the effects of pandemics, we always go to the discussion of, of our welfare states. What does it actually do to our welfare states, to our models, as we have uh, discussed earlier? And I think it was our minister that was already discussing also the issue of resilience, re resilience which is, of course, very central uh, uh, question with respect to, to our ability to cope with this crisis. And with resilience, we often talk about uh, the, the, the institutions or organizations or, or, or any kind of uh, creations and about their ability to be able to bounce back from, from, uh, from an external shock. And when we talk about uh, resilience of the welfare states, of course, we, what we want to talk and where we want to go is, is towards adaptive resilience. So there are many who have claimed so far that never miss a good crisis. Also with respect to pandemic, what we would like to see is our ability of societies to learn from, from this crisis in order to implement changes, not only to manage the current situation, but also manage the situation that may be unfolding afterwards or even new potential crises. It has also been mentioned a couple of times that, well, the welfare states and the Nordic model seems to be quite resilient. But often when we talk about resilience in, in, the, in the context of the welfare state, we actually talk about resistance to change. Uh, and actually, when we talk about welfare states, we often consider them rather unmovable objects, as Paul Pearson has said in, in, in very famous book earlier. And the idea that welfare states are very path dependent, that the history really determines what, how we are adapting to, to new changes. And the question is, to what extent we should also rethink the understanding of resilience of welfare state going beyond the understanding of resistance to change, but actually adapting adapting to the change. And under this kind of uh, understanding of resilience, we often refer, refer to this idea of resilience cycle in our societies. So we see also in the case of pandemic, we see that the responses that we give to the external crisis have been predominantly first in order to buffer to, and, and, and buffer and mitigate the effect of the crisis, then to prepare and repair, trying to adjust to the crisis, draw lessons from that in order to prevent uh, the crisis happening again, and then being able to provide us a new kind of response perhaps next time around. And 
before I'm going to, to give you some insights about but what can we now say after the first year of, of COVID uh, measures in, in, in the Nordic countries, but also outside of the Nordic region? We have to have very short view, but luckily my colleague Bent already gave you a quite uh, big understanding of how we are doing as a more Nordic wealth estates. And if you look at this, this table that we used also in a, in a publication together with Ben, we, we can see that the Nordic welfare states are doing well. That was also more or less uh, the storyline that Ben already gave. Uh, so we were doing quite well re relating to, for example, OECD averages with respect to, to the social spending uh, about unemployment, uh, also with respect to, to budgetary uh, um, uh, issues. We can see that there are differences between the Nordic countries that went also raised, but all, all in all, I can say that we were doing actually quite well. But then COVID-19 landed in our shores in, in early 2020. And basically the first reaction that buffered, this was the welfare state's first attempt to, to, to mitigate the crisis was to buffer against the, 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 the effects of, of uh, the COVID-19. And that led to different kind of measures. One of those were, of course, most visible for us, perhaps, were the lockdowns that took place in mid-March to, to uh, end of um, no, mid-May 2020, not only in, in, in the Nordic region, but eff effectively in many parts of the uh, country in Europe. And of course, some countries in, in Southern Europe, but also in the Central Europe, we could see that the lockdowns Downs were much more massive, but also with respect to, to uh, extension of that and going back and forth of the lockdowns have been quite common case, especially in the central and, and southern Europe, whereas in, in the Nordic countries, we have been quite fortunate to be able to be left uh, quite uh, into, into normal way of life in comparison to many other European countries. But basically what it meant for us in the first phase was closing of social life, working at home, closing schools, public buildings, uh, social distancing, and of course, uh, closing of the external borders. And it's very important to also, again, take in mind that well, when we talk about Nordic countries, we have this idea of similarity, but also with respect to COVID. And especially there, we had quite a harsh differences between different countries, whereas Sweden being the most suitable and, and, and the other countries, Finland uh, is an example where we took quite, quite strict measures in order to, to uh, isolate the, the virus in the beginning. But what we can see is that there are, uh, and that's the table two here in, in Ben's and, and our paper, we can show that the effect of this economic effect of the buffering, of course, was quite important and, and it was quite, uh, well, quite big, so to speak. And uh, this, they, these first buffering effects tried to really create pressures to consolidate the companies, protect workers, employers, and that gives us the understanding of how did we try to adapt. And Bent already mentioned that the way that we actually were doing uh, the first uh, period of COVID measures was very much in line of what we could uh, define already from the theoretical perspective. So we were going back to the Keynesian demand management. We really presumed a very active role of the government policy to mean demand, uh, manage demand and protect uh, against recession. So we could see active physical and monetary policy. We could see many measures uh, relating to, to reducing risks to unemployment and in order to increase also the buffering uh, of social protection to, to our uh, workers who were in, in, in risk of, for example, falling income. So in that sense, what we could see on the one hand is, is, is kind of a flexibility. So we had on the one hand, we had uh, easing and adapting of businesses, but on the other hand, we also had quite strict uh, uh, measures in order to protect our workers in order to not only avoid economic and health harms, but also social harms, which is for me, having uh, done most of my career elsewhere than in the Nordic region, I think this is one of the very, uh, very uh, characteristic uh, phenomenon in, in the Nordic states is also having the political goal also to go towards social harm. 
we could see uh, universal and relatively generous benefits being combined with some temporary measures. And that is, if, of course, interesting to see in, in terms of the future, to what extent these temporal measures are actually leading path to new kind of policies and laws coming through. So thinking in terms of, for example, extending sickness and unemployment benefits, investments in public services and benefit administration. But the important part of the learnings from the COVID crisis has been also the addressing of new kind of social protection needs. And on the one hand, you had uh, the, the risks at the labor market, which were targeted and, and very, they, they really targeted uh, certain groups of uh, workers like self-employed, freelancers, platform workers. And there we saw activity towards more protection. And then the question is, does it also leave a, a mark for the future? But also the Nordic reaction has been very friendly towards families. So also addressing needs of the parents, for example, in, in caring for their children and these exceptional times. What we need to understand better is also how these changes and these digital leaps, uh, these, these uh, leaps towards digital services has actually paid off and to what extent and what parts of that are going to be part of our new normal also after the crisis. Coming almost to my conclusion. So has the pandemic really changed the welfare states? Yes, we saw massive investments in, in, in companies, but also in workers. And we saw expansion of the benefits in a way that we would have expected to happen also with respect to the Nordic model. So we looked for inclusionary social policy, which is of course reflecting the na nature of social and equal societies that we have. We have seen already some attempts to alleviate inequalities, those that uh, Ben was also referring earlier, but we do see that there is quite considerable concern relating to the long-term consequences of this syndemic because they are targeted and mar they, are, they are focusing these, those people groups that are marginalized already. The good news of course by now is that we haven't seen mass unemployment happen yet, which was one of the scares that we had very start. Now, this is the final concluding slide. So what can we say about lessons of resilience for, for the Nordic model? I think this is very early to say, and as I have been saying, we need more research, we need more long-term uh, understanding what is taking place. But my main takeaway home message for today would be to pay uh, considerable uh, attention to, to the role of the automatic stabilizers, uh, here referring to social security benefit systems that were able to buffer us uh, in, with the first initial shocks that came from the pandemic. And it really shows us the importance of these kind of social structures, these kind of benefit systems, that they are able to protect us from the risk and adjust also to new kind of uh, situation. If we compare, for example, in more rudimentary welfare states where this kind of pr protection was not in place at the time, like a UK, US, but also in Spain, we can really see that many of the measures that have been taken after the COVID uh, outbreak have been trying to fill in the gaps that were there in the start, whereas we were able to, to, to rely on the existing structures that we already had. The question is, of course, what is the long-term effect of the pandemic? There are many monetary and social concerns that our governments have to reflect at, at, at the years to come. On the one hand, uh, we know uh, the, especially the debt uh, uh, issues relating uh, borrowing money in order to uh, well pay for, for these investments and welfare is also, of course, increases the, the, the reliance on public death. And that always brings uh, some pressure, at least uh, from some parties, in order to cut down welfare states' uh, uh, spending. On the other hand, we also see that these, these problems that we have had from the pandemic, some of them were unintended, some of them were indirect. Uh, there are a lot of different kind of uh, uh, issues relating to the effects that we don't know yet. They, but we do know that there are gaps to be filled with respect to, to education, uh, pupils' learning losses. We talked, uh, our minister talked about healthcare debt. These will actually rely on more investment, not less investment. So therefore, long-term is perspective is needed to understand the syndemic nature of this pandemic and also the direct indirect as unintended consequences. I would 
like to stop here from the freezing Helsinki. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Minna. And Mina will soon be be back for the for the discussion in about uh, yeah twenty minutes time. But before the discussion, we will move right into the heart of the Nordic welfare systems, the social policy. How has the social poli policy responded during the pandemic? And we have the right man here today to answer that question. He is a professor at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Welcome, Professor Johan Fritzel. Thank you so much, Jens. I will try to share my screen, um, which we had some problems with earlier today. Um, and now it seems to be not working again. Uh, bear with me a moment here. Uh, if it doesn't work, Johan, we can ask we can Stenk, Stenka or Heli to, to uh, to put up your your presentation and your your slides because i think they have a, have a backup for I, th so. I think i can do it now let's see uh, do you see it now yes perfect uh thank you so much to the organizers uh, for inviting me always nice to discuss uh, uh, welfare issues in in a nordic setting i think you 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 put on a special kind of lens uh, to to see uh, all the similarities but also some differences between the countries um, so we had some uh, technical problem as i alluded to earlier so i i'm afraid i have to s s show you this in a in a in a what do you call it, Adobe Acrobat uh, PDF version. So uh, sorry for that. Um, my talk and now it doesn't work again. Does it work now for you, Jens? Yes. Yes, it's yes, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so basically, I will I will talk quite much uh, from a, a perspective of a European network that I've been heavily involved in for many years called the European Social Policy Network. That means basically uh, uh, that I will uh, particularly focus on, on Sweden, Denmark and Finland. Uh, I will start by saying a few words on the pandemic as such because I think it's still uh, relevant. Uh, of course, from a health perspective, but also uh, actually from the responses taken, because these are, of course, heavily influenced of also what's happening uh, within uh, the pandemic, so to speak, and the spread of the virus. Uh, and in this sort of network, we have sort of uh, analyzed uh, the main characteristics of the changes uh, that the social policy programs have uh, uh, been going through in all European uh, or European Union countries. And, and uh, I will say a few words on sort of some of the main characteristics of the changes occurring. In general, you could say that uh, the, the I, I, th I think from a European perspective, for sure, there has never been during such a short period so many social policy changes uh, evolving in Europe. Uh, and I would say a few words about social welfare perspective outcomes uh, uh, going beyond health and mortality to say uh, what then can we learn and I think I hear we'll also echoing uh, quite a lot what Bent and, and Mina already said. Uh, I think it's time to also look forward uh, and to learn from the crisis, but also actually to looking back. Sometimes uh, that is also a, a very important issue to do. Uh, so just There is some problem with changing. Uh, just a few words on, on the European Social Policy Network. It, it's, uh, it provides, it's, or it's aimed to provide, this is from the homepage of the Commission, uh, uh, independent information and advices uh, on social policy issues to the Commission. 
uh, and in particular with relation in relation to social protection and social inclusion objectives uh, and from now on of course highlighting very much the european pillar of social rights that now are uh, sort of aimed to be implemented in in, in within europe um, and and uh, we re and on the homepage you basically can can find a lot of shorter and longer uh, uh, reports on social de policy development in in all EU twenty seven countries plus a few uh, neighboring countries. But let me start by by just saying a few words for something that you of course already know, but but still I think it's it's important to bear in mind when we discuss uh, the Nordic countries. Uh, the dramatic differences in, in how the spread of the virus occurred and, and the differences in death. Uh, this is uh, first from Finland, uh, and the, the, the blue uh, dots that you see here is the number of COVID-19 deaths in, in EU 27 as a whole uh, from the period of, of, of um, February, March in 2020 up to April 21. So it's the first and second wave, basically. And as you can see, uh, Finland uh, uh, came out of these two first waves uh, extremely well in comparison to, to EU 2027. Uh, the same is actually true for Denmark, but not to the to to, to uh, uh, the same degree. So so the death toll was was much higher uh, in Denmark, and and the concern, of course, also from a social policy perspective of that uh, was of course greater than in in Finland. My home country, Sweden, and here the the uh, wine uh, axis has to be changed because otherwise the yellow bar wouldn't fit in the in the in the in the slide so the blue uh, is actually the same as you saw before uh, but as you can see sweden was hit uh, uh, surprisingly hard uh, by both the first and, and the second and also the third or but less so the third uh, <clears throat> So, so in that sense, uh, uh, the Nordic uh, Sweden was really the outlier, as I think Mina had a, a sentence on, on on our presentation as well. Um, this is a, a, a picture of the sort of the the overall ana analysis from the European perspective and and uh, from the analysis taking and and uh, one of the issues that that was found was of course that most of the, the measures are temporary in nature. Uh, and uh, from a European perspective, uh, we recommended very strongly for most of the countries actually that they should now seize the opportunity created by the adoption of these uh, temporary measures to, to increase social protection system in the European settings and, and, and this, um, sort of accelerating or deepening uh, uh, policies to, uh, to, to, to uh, structural reforms. So from a European perspective, it is, I think, uh, uh, relatively clear that uh, we suggest that uh, many of these temporary uh, adoptions uh, should be made more uh, permanent. But and that is sort of uh, the the overall. I think uh, we have had more. I think more than fifty recommendations for for how to go along this way. When we look at Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, we can see that uh, there are quite many similarities, but also some differences, which which partly sort of I think uh, relates to the fact that the pandemic hit uh, differently, but also. Uh, differences that that sort of reflect differences in the welfare state system between uh, the Nordic welfare uh, countries. Uh, you can see that almost exclusively uh, the changes were made within existing schemes, uh, not so much. There are a few examples, but not so much new uh, measures taken. Uh, and what's also apparent is that th these are temporary changes going back and forth in time as new waves of the pandemic appeared, uh, ending dates of certain changes of, of, of social protection system, whether it's sickness benefits or, or unemployment benefits or something else, uh, uh, are then extended and taken back and forth in time. Uh, 
Uh, the benefits were basically uh, increasing take up uh, by loosening eligibility criteria, work requirements, and so on and so forth. Waiting days to get uh, the benefits were abolished. Um, in Sweden, actually from today, uh, waiting days in sickness insurance, uh, sickness benefits is now abolished again uh, as the fourth wave are, are rolling in. Uh, and in some cases, quite many actually changes also uh, uh, to sort of try to to include also non-standard workers and, and self-employed, and that is actually have been a key issue, I think, uh, for the work we have tried to do in the European Social Policy Network. Perhaps most influential, uh, at least from a macroeconomic perspective, is, is various ven versions of job retention schemes. Basically meaning, uh, and there are different wordings here, and, and the, there's so, not so clear cut division here, but basically you can have state subsidies reducing working hours or, or giving uh, support to wages, or you can have both as was the case in, in, in uh, Denmark. Uh, whereas Sweden uh, more uh, had state subsidy for reducing working hours. Uh, and this was, of course, extremely uh, important uh, for unemployment. Uh, compared to Europe, you could say within housing policy that uh, Sweden, Denmark and Finland didn't do so much uh, Sweden did something. Uh, we had an, an automatic increase of the housing allowances for, for a while. Uh, but uh, uh, housing policy was actually turned out in many corners of Europe to be one of the most extreme and most difficult issues where there is definitely room for structural reforms. But not so much in, 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 in the Nordic countries, which is uh, not to say that we don't care, but rather, uh, uh, I think both my Danish and Finnish colleagues uh, argue that our, our policies are so good, so we don't really need to adapt that much. Um, in, in, when it comes to housing policies for the most vulnerable, the homeless, the, the housing first policy, which I'm sure there are many people in, in from Finland who knows much more than I am, uh, is a sort of a, an ideal, uh, something that the whole Europe is looking on, on uh, from, uh, from Finland. Uh, I think, uh, and here uh, I, I, I sort of was a bit uncertain whether, whether or not Bent and I had different views, but I think more focus has been on directly on the sort of uh, cash side of the welfare states, as opposed to care and social services. I'm not saying that uh, in the long run, care and social services is, stress, is sort of becoming more and more important. I would argue that they should become more important. Uh, but but it's perhaps easier sometimes for uh, the state to to make adapt, uh, changes uh, in, for example, unemployment benefits or, or sickness insurance systems and so on and so forth, than to to uh, make uh, similar changes in, in care and social services. Uh, but these all these different reforms, then I should underline that these are not Nordics uh, being exceptional, but rather within the European Union, there has been uh, uh, substantial uh, social policy reforms, uh, but almost exclusively also uh, temporary. And it was the first time I think the European Union decided to, to uh, to sort of um, make this sort of Keynesian demand management and say to, to the states that uh, don't 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 bother about the budget deficits, but you should uh, you should uh, increase public spending. Uh, I will not go into details on on all these uh, changes, but but um, can of course uh, go, come back to that in the discussion if if needed. We can, of course, as, as both Bent and, and Mina said, uh, we cannot really say anything about the long-term outcomes of, of the pandemic, but we can say that uh, uh, there is only modest increases in unemployment and it's lowered again during 2021, as far as we can measure them. But again, I would say that 
remember that the Nordic countries are not so specifically exceptional in this case. Actually, the lowering of unemployment during 2021 is, uh, is very modest uh, in Sweden and Finland. Uh, and many other uh, European countries have seen a stronger lowering of unemployment uh, during uh, the late, latest months. And, and uh, remembering also that in particular Sweden and Finland are not really uh, any distinct in terms of unemployment measures. We are still very good in employment uh, uh, participation, but we have, we have and have had for a long time uh, quite high unemployment uh, uh, figures. The income inequality and at-risk of poverty estimates are, are also uh, stable as far as we know at the moment. There is also a lag also here in statistical production, but as far as we can see, not so much really happened uh, in terms of uh, uh, poverty estimates uh, in, in 2020, which basically is the last point, time point we hear. So in terms of, of, of uh, uh, the stress test, I would certainly agree with, I think, what bo both Bent and, and Mina said, that we, are, we have been able to, to work quite well, uh, and in particular in the sort of cash side of, of social welfare production. But I think it's important, uh, and that is also going back to, to sort of the long-term uh, discussion, uh, the pandemic has highlighted the social inequalities, uh, social inequalities that I think most of us in these rooms were uh, uh, quite familiar with, but it has highlighted them in a different way, uh, which uh, uh, has a ramification, I think, for future discussion. And uh, the pandemic has also highlighted deficiencies, I would say, in, in care and social services. Here it might be differences between the Nordic countries as well, but for sure in, 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 in terms of long-term care, I think uh, uh, the pandemic has highlighted a lot of, of uh, deficiencies uh, of different kinds uh, that that needs to be addressed by the Nordic welfare states. They might be different differences here as well. Uh, for example, the out-of-pocket uh, payment for, for uh, long-term care is very high in Finland. It's for free in Denmark. So there are differences here. Uh, and there is a sort of a health depth created by, by the pandemic, which uh, means uh, have, have ramification also in possibly in, in the longer run. Uh, so to sort of uh, then end looking forward, I think it's important, but I also think it's important to not lose track of, of uh, uh, what's happening in the, in, in, in the, uh, long time ago. Uh, is there reasons to rethink? Uh, I think Mina said that uh, no crisis are, are uh, all crises are very good for uh, new opportunities to make changes. And, and uh, one issue then is should, should any of these temporary uh, measures be turned into permanent reforms? From a European perspective, uh, our conclusion within this network is clear. Yes, quite many of them should be permanent because they have highlighted uh, the need and, and, uh, for structural reforms and, and the gaps in, in social protections in many, many different ways. More sort of uh, not so easily to respond uh, from a uh, from a Nordic setting, I think. Um, my Danish colleague, uh, Jon Quist, argued that, uh, no, not really. Um, these are temporary measures and, and we should sort of leave it to the, to the market and the welfare state to, to, to sort of deal with the rest. Uh, it's very good that we have had these temporary measures, but, but they, they can be economically harmful uh, in normal times, so to speak. Uh, Personally, I think in taking a Swedish perspective, I think there is a need to discuss whether or not we should have waiting days in sickness insurance systems, whether or not uh, we shouldn't be a bit more generous uh, in terms of uh, unemployment benefits, uh, both in terms of the generosity, but also in terms of the eligibility. Uh, in Sweden, for example, only a third of those people who are unemployed in the beginning of the pandemic had the right to, to uh, unemployment benefit. 
But I also think there is a possible trade-off here between the cash and the care service in the Nordic welfare state that has been sort of highlighted by the pandemic uh, and, and a need for a higher prioritization of care and services. Uh, also, again, there might be differences here in, 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 within the Nordic countries, but I think not least due to demographic aging, a uh, higher prioritization of care and services is necessary. Uh, and I think uh, we have had a sort of a, a not enough money put into that, that uh, pocket of the welfare state, so to speak. But the highlighting of social inequalities has also meant that uh, I think we not only should have the slogan that is so common now in Europe, building back better, but also building back fairer, because uh, the well-known social inequalities uh, are really uh, up to the front now. And now I try to move again. But I also think we should look back and put the crisis a bit in a perspective. Uh, and uh, you guys who have been around for, for some years remember the crisis of the early 90s. And here you see it's a bit, um, this should be a moving uh, picture. But anyway, uh, the, the yellow and orange curves are the unemployment uh, uh, development in Finland and Sweden. Uh, I only did it for these two countries uh, from 2010 to 20. Uh, and the uh, uh, blue and gray lines are the similar development during 1990 to 2000. And um, perhaps some of you younger uh, who weren't around then don't remember, but uh, uh, the extreme development of unemployment in Sweden from, from the year 1991 to 1993, 94. But compared to this unrealistic unemployment shock that we went through then, it was nothing compared to what happened in Finland, who, who went from, from three to uh, 17 or something like that uh, uh, within a short period of time. Uh, so I think, and again, the, the increases that you see uh, uh, here from, from uh, 2020, it, uh, is, is going, it seems to be going uh, a bit lower again uh, during the latest uh, six months or so. But it, that might be, of course, uh, something that will change again, depending on how the fourth wave uh, appears. But I think um, this shows that the, at least when it comes to unemployment, poverty, real poverty, and so on and so forth, uh, the pandemic has not had uh, anything like the effects of the early 1990 crisis for, for Sweden and Finland. So, in sum, uh, many temporary reforms of existing schemes during the pandemic and, a, and an important issue is to what extent uh, some of them should be made uh, more permanent. Uh, the welfare states in the Nordic countries have on the cash side managed well. Uh, the stress test that was alluded to earlier is definitely something that uh, our model has been shown to, to clear very well. But the pandemic has highlighted what I would regard as well-known deficiencies in care and services, most evident within long-term care. And the pandemic has highlighted well-known social inequalities. I, I say well-known because for, for the research communities, it is, comes perhaps as no surprise that uh, also the, 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 the virus is, is sort of not uh, spreading as, as quickly and, and uh, killing as much. Uh, in the upper strata as in the lower strata. Actually, the, the mortality rates uh, by social class is about the same for, for COVID-19 as it is for mortality as, as a totally. And finally, that we should try to build back uh, not only better, but also fairer. Kitos. Kitos. Johan, thank you. Johan, you can keep your camera and your microphone open, Johan, and I also say welcome back to Bent and Minna. We have now heard from Denmark, we have heard from Finland and from Sweden, but not from Norway yet. Now is the time for Norway. I say welcome to Honorat Muhansi. 
Honorat, she is a general manager of Velfads Alliance and EAPN Norway, a non-governmental organization in um, Norway. Uh, I will start with you, Honorat, and we will uh, speak now Scandinavian for a couple of minutes, so there won't be any subtitles available now for, for a couple of, of minutes. Honorat, do jobbar då alltså inom en NGO, en non-governmental organisation. Vad skulle du säga om den roll det civila samhället eller NGOs har spelat under pandemin? Ja, tusen tack för invitation och tusen tack för spörsmål. Jag ska se si lite om den erfaring som vi har haft genom vår nätverk, genom organisationen som är medlemmar i vårt nätverk och som jobbar på gräsrota. Vår upplevelse är att då pandemin inträff i 2020 och samfundet blev stängt helt ner. Så blev det avslört att både välfärdssystemet och offentlig tjänst var väldigt sårbara. Och den sårbarheten har bland annat avdäckt att välfärdssystemet är helt avhängiga av NGOs eller civilsamfundet för att klara sig. Eftersom civilsamfundet hade tagit en stor del av jobben som egentligen staten borde ha gjort. Jag kan ta ett exempel hur många NGO i civilsamfundet var väldigt avgörande i den corona, för att spre corona information eller att bistå människor som hade begränsat digitala kunskap och folk som lever i fattigdom och social exkludering som var väldigt avhängiga av hjälp men kom mycket i kontakt med eh, välfärdssystem eller social tjänst för det var inte helt tillgängligt för eh, alla samman. Så eh, NGO och civilsamfundet har spelat en avgörande roll eh, akkurat där. Ja, det är det jag kan säga. Mm. En, en konstig fråga, Honorat, till, till dig ett, uh, ett spörsmål. Ser du någonting positivt med pandemin? Alltså har det, har det fört någonting gott eller någonting positivt med sig när du ser det ur NGO-perspektiv? Ja, selv om eh, pandemin i sig selv är något som eh, hade många sådana negativ konsekvenser för människor så har det kommit något bra. Och det som är bra så blir det väldigt synligt. De sociala olikheter som finns i samhället blev väldigt synliga. För pandemin så var det kanske folk som hade det tufft, som hade det vanskligt och någon i civilsamhället som prövde och löfte upp den problemstillingen, men vi blev inte hört. Med pandemin så blev det väldigt, väldigt synligt. Och där hoppas vi att alla kan reflektera över lösningar till dessa problem. Och så det som vi upplevde är att Västortingsvalget som vi hade nu i september var ulikhet eller fattigdom en av de största tema som kom på agenda och det är första gången att den kom väldigt på agenda för både partierna i position och i opposition alla samman och så välgare som befolkning flest. Alla var upptatt av ulikheten av fattigdomen. Så eh, och så vi upplever att folk som eh, lever i fattigdom eh, tör och står fram No, en för. Så för var det mycket skam, mycket tabu. Det har fortsatt skam och tabu. Men de står fram för de har förstått att hvis vi ska få lösning så måste vi stå fram med egna historier och våra ansikter, så att historien blir äkta.
Yeah. Thank you, Honorat. I would like to ask you also, Johan, Minna, and, and Bent, the, the same maybe strange question. Do you see any positive aspects to the to the pandemic? Well, if I start, I mean, uh, I think I can echo what Honorati just said very much. That that uh, what I tried to say that social inequalities that perhaps we researchers have known for for a long time has now been at the forefront and and. Uh, and sometimes to the surprise, even at the top level of, of state authorities and so on. Oh, I hadn't a clue that that could be the case. So, so I think that is a is a first step. Um, so yeah, that that's what come to my mind immediately. Maybe Bent can can continue. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can see some issues. Uh, I mean, the the one uh, one I could argue is that. It has shown that we can work in other ways than we used to do. I mean, we're having this conference online. We have been able to work online. There's been private companies who have been able to sell products in China, still staying in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So there are some, some transitions. Also with the challenges, I'm not seeing the challenges. It's also shown, as I think Mina, in, in fact, rightly point to, it has shown the importance of having automatic stabilizers in the economy. And the welfare state is an automatic stabilizer in the sense that if it's going down, there are some benefits which will help keeping the demand up. We don't, we didn't have to make a lot of decisions. I mean, we need to make something about reten job retention and, and supporting the companies. But most of the benefits, as also your hand pointed towards, was the same, but they worked as an automatic stabilizer. So they, it's, in a sense, it's important just to have the welfare state to cope with sudden shocks uh, in, in the in the economy, so I think that that's part of it. It also showed that that the welfare states, uh, I mean, were able to pay for medicine, were able to have the healthcare sector working, were able to to find new ways to solve a dramatic change in, in our living standard. So in this sense, I, I think um, it has shown to the the good things of of the welfare state as well. Mm. Do you mean I like to to comment on that? Yes, 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 very quickly. I, I do agree with my colleagues indeed about the, the points made and also with Honorata. Um, but I think also, uh, indeed, uh, my claim is that we need automatic stabilizers that have been indicated quite well, I think, in, in the crisis. We have seen that they work, just like Ben was saying. But I also think that there's, there's something what we have learned now, indeed, with the digitalization of services. And I think there are many lessons that we can draw from, from the current experiences. On the one hand, how, how to in, improve the accessibility of certain kind of services, especially in countries like Finland, where you, where we, and also other Nordic countries, they are very extent, large countries with a lot of remote areas. What can we learn about providing services? But we should not forget that we also need face-to-face -face, uh, services so we need to be able to balance this out and especially those vulnerable that needs to as, as Honorato was saying they, they have faces they have to be seen uh, we really do also must we must also make sure that this digitalization doesn't lead into digital divide and that we also have services for those who are not able to cope uh, for any reason with these kind of services mm. yeah Good, good comment, Minna. I honor that en, en fråga till, till dig ännu. Vi hörde professor Johan Fritzell säga att nu ska vi build back better and build back more fair. Alltså bygga någonting som är bättre före pandemin och, och bygga också någonting som är mer rättvist. Om du honor att skulle få, få vara den som bestämmer över det här bygget, hur skulle det se ut? Eh, hvis jag skulle bestämma så hade jag sagt att eh, de som bestämmer måste människor och möta dem var de är och lite till dem och inkludera människor i i lösningar för de var upplever så att ofta Eh, beslutentakare sitter där på kontoret, stortinget eller vad det är och bestämmer ting. Men de må inkludera, vi är väldigt upptatt av medverkning. Visst vi är en del av den medverkning, visst vi är en del av, eh, eh, den ska jag säga, av lösning 
ingenting om oss utan oss jag tror det kan vara en nyckel att mm. de lyter till de som upplever fattigdom för det de är sammansatt eh, grund till att folk hamnar i fattigdom och det kan inte vara bara en lösning som inkluderar alla folk må mötas var de är det är det som jag hade sagt och gjort tack ja yeah. so what do you say briefly bent minna and and johan could this be a, a long term consequence or a, a permanent reform that honorat is saying here listen more to the people one of the reasons to the challenges we see now is that uh, the politicians the one who are deciding deciding they are not listening to the people anymore in the same way as they did before briefly please i think that's a tricky question uh, uh, um... And it's not simple to answer that question. I mean, the whole issue about populism is about you have we the people and you the elite. And those arguing say we the elite is not listening to the people. Um, and and sometimes there's a there's a difference between listening and and be having the right to decide what to do. Mm. I think you, one of the no. challenges of the welfare state is that there are so many different expectations. Mm, yeah. and we do not have unlimited resources, so mm. there need to be some kind of prioritizing. Mm. And the clash is also on the chat with the welfare chauvinism is that we can see in studies um, that people are supporting pension, long-term care and health care. They do not really support unemployment benefits, social assistance, uh, uh, etc. So here we also have a clash between giving those on the margin of society a better position. And, and I mean, the reason populism and welfare chauvinism seemingly have an impact is that we there are some people having the, the feeling they're standing on the platform, not getting on the train. Mm, yeah. The train is running, it's running fast, somewhat is getting richer. They're still standing there. They still have the same living standard as they had 10, 15 years ago. And they do not like to support someone who they do not feel is legitimate receivers of benefits. Mm. And they, they say that, in fact, often without knowing the level of the benefits. Oh. So, so, oh. so, I mean, it, it, it's, mm. it's, not, oh. it's not that simple to answer no, the question, no. but I think it's important that we in the welfare states have a good dialogue between state, market, and civil society. Mm. And the because all three issues in this welfare triangle is needing one another in order to form a coherent society. Mm -hmm. Minna and Johan, briefly, before the break. I, I can just agree, basically, what, uh, what Ben was saying. It's really, it's, it's a, a very fundamental question. And, and indeed, I think the way that the Finnish government is now reforming our, our social security system it is a kind of a, a, start, a starting point is to really hear these voices and have a very a very broad engagement have this parliamentary committee in a long perspective having seven years to discuss this i think that would be hmm. hopefully we will be able to take everybody's voices that uh, want to be heard yes uh, johan you will get the last word yeah i'm i'm sort of uh, yeah i mean the populist movement if i call it that uh, around the western world shows that th this is extremely important to to sort of not having this strong divide between we the people so to speak and the elite uh, so in that sense it's of course extremely important for the elite to realize that um i was also thinking of something that bent said i mean from from the from the, the the deep crisis of the early 90s uh, the real t crisis for in terms of inequality uh, in finland and sweden appeared after the macroeconomic crisis when the train started going again not everybody did jump uh, on the train and and therefore unemployment uh, and poverty rates are now still much, much higher uh, than they were uh, before the early crisis. So I think that is something that could be happening again. And, and it is very important that we that we sort of uh, well, monitor that and, and try to, to copy it. So, yeah. Thank you, Johan. More solutions later on in this conference when we are going to talk 
a lot of more about building back and building back more fair. Thank you, Minna. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Bent. And thank you, Honorat.